tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast, bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, listeners, and welcome back to Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody. You know, the last few episodes have featured several shorter stories, so I figured that it was high time to focus on a single tale of terror this evening. The story in question is The Incorruptible Corpse by T.F. Ahmad. We open on a deserted stretch of beach near the town of Raven's Cove. Our narrator, Everett, is scouring the beach for any misplaced items of value when he stumbles across something quite extraordinary. Instead of the usual trinkets that he finds, today he has found a corpse. The corpse of a beautiful young woman, to be exact. As he notifies the local constabulary, he sets off a chain of bizarre events that will change Raven's Cove and the lives therein forever. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today and get instant access. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. And now, from author T.F. Ahmad, I give you... The Incorruptible Corpse. I was walking along Erston Beach near the cove, looking for shiny metal objects. Many of these could be sold for scrap to out-of-town metallurgists. This was my primary source of income then, and I was on the beach for hours every day. I was looking off into the distance when I saw the waves crash against a bundle about 40 feet away. I got excited, for the bundle was large. No one would object to my salvage claim as long as the item wasn't claimed as another's property. 
I threw my canvas collection bag over my shoulder. My shoes squelched with every step, and I hoped that this find would fetch a high enough price to mend the holes in my footwear. I quickened my pace as I noticed the tide coming in. My prize might soon be lost. I was out of breath when I reached the bundle and collapsed to my knees. Despite my young age, poverty had stolen most of the health from my bones. The bundle appeared to be wrapped in a tattered sheet that was dirty with stains common to a long journey at sea. It was covered in seaweed, which I pulled off in handfuls. I turned the bundle over. Before me lay the corpse of a woman. I recoiled and placed my hands over my face as if this would cause the corpse to disappear. I had found dead things before, fish or a runaway pet. This was my first human body. I forced myself to look. She was nude, her pale skin glistening in the sunlight. There were no visible signs of injury or decay. She could have been taking a nap for all I knew. I reached out and touched her. She was ice cold. The feeling of her skin under my fingers made me run for the town constable. Before I left, I grabbed a handful of seaweed and laid it over her face, tucking her night black hair beneath her head. The overwhelming beauty of her unnerved me. The town of Raven's Cove was a small coastal settlement surrounded by hills and cliffs. These hills and cliffs offered pristine hiking trails once popular with tourists. The beaches used to be full of people sunbathing and sailing in the cove. Main Street bustled with shoppers, and the taverns were full of revelers sipping pints of ale in the salty breeze. But then the weather became foul. Warm, breezy summers were slowly replaced with sweltering heat and record humidity. The winters, which began as cool and windy affairs, became freezing and snowy ordeals. The tourists still came, but left with sour tastes in their mouths. The number of visitors dwindled year after year. The beaches were abandoned, and the shops on Main Street shuttered. The town's demise was almost assured. Ray Bray, head constable, arrived at the beach with frightening urgency. He wasted no time in ordering his deputies to form a perimeter. News of the body had traveled fast, and Constable Bray ensured that none of the townspeople upset the crime scene. The sun had swung across the sky towards the horizon before I was let go. I wasn't privy to any investigation details and was told to have a pint to settle your nerves. I pushed my way through the late afternoon crowd of sweaty men, all elbows, body odor, and gutter curses. I went to the town square where I entered B's Tavern. I found a sliver of open bar and reached forward to order a beer, but one was already before me. The thin bartender smiled, his large mustache dancing in good humor. Everett, my friend, this one's on the house, he said. I didn't look a gift horse in the mouth. Thank you, Ben. I placed a copper penny on the bar for a tip. Ben swiped it with practiced swiftness and tucked it away in an unseen pocket. Heard you made a gruesome discovery at the beach today, he said. He was still smiling, and it began to annoy me a bit. Yes, I did. I took a big gulp of beer to hide the stutter that was emerging in my voice. I haven't been down to the beach, the barkeeper said, swinging his arm around the room. Obviously, but I heard the beach is now swarming with connies swinging their cudgels and bellowing useless questions. I nodded. Ben was my best and only friend in Raven's Cove. He was often crass and sometimes rude, but spoke from the heart. People like him were in short supply in Raven's Cove these days. 
He gave me discounts on beer and let me mop up at the end of the night for extra coins. I wonder who it is, Ben mused. Excuse me, I said, not hearing him at first. I said, do any of us know her? Maybe she's a townie. Did you get a good look at her? I remembered the woman's pale, beautiful face. She wasn't familiar at all. She didn't have the fatalistic gaze of a townie, beaten down by poverty and discriminatory local ordinances. She might have been a tourist, but that was unlikely. There weren't very many of those at the tail end of a sweltering summer. I shivered, thinking that a dead face should not be so perfect. No, I said. I don't think she was a townie. Hmm... Ben said. I wonder if she was a tourist. I didn't remove that assertion from his mind. Either way, he continued, there has to be some way to identify her. The bartender left me with that. I finished my beer in silence and left, not wanting to remain in a crowd. The night was cool as I returned to my small apartment above the post office. It was drafty in the winter and a furnace in the summer, but it was home. I thought about the bottle of brandy I had stored away and the thick book on the nightstand. I knew how I would spend my evening, sipping the cheap liquor while reading my tattered S.H. Ward paperback. The window cracked to let in the breeze. I wanted to go trawling in the sand again, but the police guarded the beach tightly. I spent the next few days trying to sell what I'd gathered from the beach that week. I only got a few silver pieces and too many copper pieces of small denomination. It was just enough for my week's expenses, including a full evening of drinking. As I approached B's tavern, I noticed a large crowd in the center of the square. Usually, a crowd of this size gathered for speeches from Mayor Abernathy Hall, but there wasn't a stage or podium. I craned my neck, but couldn't see what everyone was so keen on. My thirst won over my curiosity, and I entered the tavern. It was noticeably more crowded than my last visit, which seemed impossible. I paid for two beers and sat out on the patio. I took a sip from each beer, making sure everyone saw me doing so, lest they think either of the beers was up for grabs. It was a good ten minutes before I could flag down a bartender to take my order. The day was warm and pleasant. "'Thirsty fella, aren't you?' said a grizzled voice to my right. I turned to eye a man I didn't know. He was large, with tan, leathery skin and greasy black hair that flowed seamlessly into his massive beard. I gestured towards the crowd in the square. Would you happen to know what's going on? I asked. The man took a large gulp of ale and wiped his forearm across his mouth. Don't rightly know. Someone said it was a lovely lady. A lovely lady? I asked. Like a dancer? The man shook his head. Not a dancer, just a lovely lady. I made a non-committal sound and went back to my beer. The man seemed keen to talk more, but soon lost interest in me and began chatting with the person across from him. I watched the crowd ebb and flow. Most went about their lives, eager to head home to a hot meal. A sizable portion of people stopped to gather around the unseen attraction, waiting for a turn to see the lovely lady, I wagered. I went inside and found Ben tapping a beer for a customer. I ordered another drink. After he'd given me an expert pour, I slapped down a tip and asked him what was going on out in the square. He seemed surprised by my question. You haven't heard? I shook my head. His knowing, mischievous smile emerged. His mustache danced with glee. He was enjoying my ignorance. Come on, Ben, I pleaded. 
I've been away selling my shitty wares all day. What's going on? Ben maintained his Cheshire grin. You'll just have to go outside and see. You technically weren't allowed to drink in the streets, but I took my beer outside anyway. As I walked, I studied people's faces. Some looked as if they were trying to erase what they had seen. Others looked angry. Still more had smiles on their faces. I was unsure what could cause such a mixture of reactions until I rubbed shoulders with two sweaty, burly men to reach the object of everyone's fascination. It was the corpse that I had found on the beach. I studied the corpse more closely. She was laid in an upright and tilted glass coffin as if she was trying to catch the sun's angle. Her arms were across her chest, each hand on the opposite shoulder. I stopped breathing, my grip tightening on my mug. I took a shaky sip, took a second, then a third. Someone had thought to put her in a white funerary gown. She had small features, a button nose, dainty ears, and thin lips. Her eyes were closed, and her raven black hair had been combed. The look of vitality in her was striking, even a day after I'd found her. A large sign above her read, Do you know who I am? Who did this to you? I thought. I know she's dead, I heard someone say, but she sure is beautiful. And so alive, came another voice behind me. I'd swear she was ready to open her eyes at any moment. There was a sudden crash. Everyone was staring at me. The conversation around me had ceased. I looked down and saw my mug had fallen out of my hand and broken on the stones. A small puddle of foamy beer slid towards the glass coffin. I'm sorry, I said, turned, and pushed through the crowd. I had a difficult time sleeping that night. It wasn't long before all of Raven's Cove was talking about the woman in the square. I heard whispers of her beauty. I heard startling speculations on how she might have met her fate. I heard about how she appeared to be one second away from opening up her eyes. Laying her out in the square didn't lead to an identification. The woman was nude and was said to contain no unique physical characteristics or scars. Her face was beautiful and unblemished, which didn't make sense for a corpse twirling and tumbling in the violent seas of the cove before being dashed onto the shore. Her race was indeterminable, as if she possessed mothers of every race of womankind. The local doctor, Verity Skander, was unable to determine a cause of death based on an autopsy. None of her arteries were clogged, her lungs and airways were free of any obstruction, and there were no signs of internal bleeding. Every organ appeared to be in perfect health. The rumors began to travel like the wind from the sea, strong and unrepentant. The corpse was an elaborate prank designed to scare tourists away. Or she was a complex and detailed mannequin that had been thrown away from a department store in one of the glittering cities whose lights could be seen across the bay. The corpse was also considered something more sinister, but it took a lot of work to pin down details in those claims, making their provenance dubious. It didn't help that the corpse hadn't decayed since I had found it. I avoided the square as much as I could, which was hard because almost everything I needed in my daily life was off the square, especially my favorite tavern. No one ever told me how difficult it would be to not look at something you were dreadfully aware of. Don't tell me you haven't taken a look. Ben said one night. 
I had arrived early after an unsuccessful day at the beach. I tried to keep to my routine of combing the sand for valuables, but the beaches were now covered in sunbathing tourists, like acne on a pockmarked face. Everything I found was either worthless, kicked into the sea, or belonged to someone else. I got strange looks, like I was somehow the one who didn't belong. My pocketbook was getting so light I thought the wind would carry it away. I could barely scrounge the leftover change for more than a few beers each evening. I took one look at that thing in the square, I said, and bolted. It's a horrible sight to behold. Ben filled my mug and swiped his hand across his throat, indicating that this one was on the house. That thing, he said, is a beautiful woman. Was a beautiful woman. Still beautiful. The tavern owner leaned forward like he was about to impart some sage wisdom for my ears only. You can't deny the effect she's been having on this town. We haven't had anything except suffering and decay for so long. Something strange, beautiful, and inexplicable has literally washed ashore, and almost overnight, Raven's Cove has shifted somehow, as if nudged by the hand of a giant. It's amazing to see. You speak as if the death of a woman is something to be celebrated, I said, hoping to catch Ben in a trap. Not at all. Something has happened that is beyond all reason. It defies a rational explanation. That, in and of itself, is worth celebrating. I looked around the crowded bar and out towards the crowded square. I guess extra business is something to be celebrated as well, I said. A large smile grew on the tavern owner's face. Always. We drank in silence for a bit. Hey, Everett? Ben asked. Yeah? Would you like a job here, in the tavern? We could use a few extra hands. I smiled. I thought you'd never ask. I started at B's tavern at exactly the right time. The town had a vitality it hadn't experienced in years, perhaps decades. Hotels dusted off their keys and cleaned the bedsheets. Restaurants updated their menus with local seafare and vegetables from the surrounding farms. Curio shops stocked the latest in kitschy trends, some of which would have felt at home in my tattered canvas sack from my beachcombing days. Everybody's step seemed lighter, every set of shoulders stronger. Even the sky seemed to take pleasure in the town's newfound health. The clouds parted to provide sunny afternoons. Rainy days seemed to have gone extinct. I was a bit more subdued. As I cleared empty mugs and wiped down tables with a damp dish rag, I was keenly aware of the reason why everyone crowded the hotels, taverns, and beaches. Everyone was here to gaze at the artifact, as the tourism board had dumped her. Working in a popular tavern right on the square did have its advantages. The obvious one was the pay. I was finally able to fix the drafty window in my apartment. I had my ancient rug replaced. Previously, I'd only been able to purchase a couple of books at a time, and had to sell what I owned in order to purchase more. Now I had a stack of books on my nightstand, all new and all my own. The regulars at the tavern all recycled the same conversation. Most were the type who sipped their ale quietly, staring into their mugs as if they held the antidote to their despair. The tourists, however, spoke loudly and seemed to revel in being heard. They mostly spoke of the artifact. I hear she blinks, but only when she isn't being observed. I can't wait to see the famous lady. I hear she has the prettiest hair and the fairest skin. It's quite disgusting what this town is displaying in its square. 
I'm curious what it says about the psychology of these simple small town folk. The mayor of my town has personally asked me to come and see if we can replicate something like this. The taboo subject matter makes this art installation all the more titillating. I tried to block out their conversations, but it was exhausting. Every night I collapsed into bed fully clothed, only to have nightmares invade my sleep. Little did I know that the true nightmare was just beginning. The first disappearance occurred close to midsummer. A man named Burton Axeldove was last seen drinking at the Waterways Tavern across the square from Bees. Witnesses reported that after downing an obscene amount of beer, Mr. Axeldove stumbled toward the center of the square. This was close to the last call. Poorly maintained gas lamps lit the square. From there, no one knows where he went. He was first reported as a delinquent for failing to pay the weekly rent at his lodgings. This assessment was changed when his room was searched. He hadn't been there for days. Food lay rotten on the kitchen table, and Mr. Axeldove's beloved pit bull terrier was weak from hunger and thirst. This was the first major disappearance in years, and the constables publicly addressed the town to assuage any fears. Mayor Hall was adamant that Raven's Cove was still a safe and secure vacation destination. It was determined that Burton Axeldove likely drowned in the cove as a result of going for an ill-advised drunken swim. The town collectively wiped their brows and went on with their lives. An accidental death was a death easily forgotten. That was until the body was found. Burton Axeldove's mutilated body was found in a narrow and disused alleyway off the square. His enormous belly had been sliced open. His intestines lay on the dirty cobbles in a pool of blood and mingled fat. The pale pallor of his skin stood out against the dark bloodstains splotched all over his body. His clothing was in tatters. The constable's theory of drowning was thrown out, and the townspeople began to whisper of a killer in their midst. Despite the brutality of the crime, Mayor Hall didn't address the town. Mr. Axeldove had been poor, so he only mattered a little to the mayor. The tourism numbers were unaffected by this tragedy. It was chalked up as an isolated incident in a backwater town. But I heard murmurs in the bar. Regulars who used to drink silently now grumbled about Burton Axeldove's fate. Some had known him from around town and lamented the passing of a man who, despite his rough nature, was one of their own. Others focused their ire on Mayor Hall, who didn't seem to give any shits about his own citizens. The next person to disappear was Abdul Dorga. Dorga was from the far-off city of Erontia, which lay on the edge of an oasis in a vast desert. I had never heard of the place, but the wealthier tourists came from this city. Their coal-black skin and fine, colorful robes were a welcome splash of life. Interactions with the townsfolk were cordial. Dorgo was last seen with his wife walking through the curio shops that ran along one side of the square. They purchased several keychains, a couple of canvases painted by locals, and a tea set that the salesperson insisted was unique, but was in fact identical to dozens of others hidden in a back room. They took their possessions to the Eiler Hotel where the doorman recalled seeing Mr. Dorga leave by himself around 10 p.m. No one saw the man after that. His battered and bloody body was found in a narrow alley off the square, just as Mr. Axeldove had been found. This alley was also seldom used and was lined with refuse. Dorga's body had been cut open and his innards splayed on the cobbles. 
His eyes were open and full of fear, staring at some unseen phantasm in the distance. Blood lay in thick pools. People began to speak openly of a maniac on the prowl. As sundown approached, constables patrolled the streets, urging everyone to make for their dwellings. Tourists checked out of hotels early, making vague statements about just-remembered obligations. Mothers called their children in early, hoping their concern would chase away the darkness. The woman in the square was remembered during this time, though fewer people stopped to gaze at her form. She lay there in repose, her face serene, her skin milk-white, her dark hair perfectly straight. It was a rainy autumn night when the patron came into the bar. I didn't recognize him at first, but as he pushed his long, rain-soaked hair away from his face, I saw the visage of Pembroke Stiles, the local postman. I had never seen him walk into Bee's Tavern before. He shuffled to the bar and ordered a drink from Ben, who was looking somber. The bar was nearly empty. As the summer wound down and autumn approached, the weather turned from pleasantly warm to wet and windy. The murders hadn't helped matters either, and the busy summer season wound down sooner than expected. Patrons grumbled and shivered as they drank their ale. Rain and wind lashed at the poorly maintained windows. I sat on the stool next to Penbrook. Ben grabbed two goblets and filled them with strong ale. He placed one in front of me and kept one for himself. I saw that Penbrook was idly turning his glass of whiskey in his hand, seemingly intent on not drinking it. He abruptly sat up straight and downed his drink, startling me so much that my first sip of ale missed my mouth and fell down the front of my shirt. I kept an admonishment to myself once I saw the hard lines etched into his face. This was a man marshalling all of his strength to drive away a fear that was threatening to swallow him whole. It was a look of bravery and resolve. It was a quality that I wished I had stowed away in great abundance. Another one? Ben asked, already reaching for the bottle before Penbrook nodded. Thanks, the postman said, taking a gentler sip this time. His expression deflated. I'm not usually a drinker. After your shock, it's a surprise you haven't robbed a liquor store. This comment elicited bland humor from Penbrook and frustrating curiosity from me. Ben saw my look. Would you mind repeating what you told me to Everett here? He said. Penbrook turned and looked at me as if he had just noticed I was there. It wouldn't have surprised me if that were the case. He looked me up and down, assessing me. Everett here is a good one, Ben said. I think it's important that he hears this. The weary postman seemed to think on it for a few seconds, before downing his second glass of whiskey and tapping the rim for a refill. Ben dutifully obliged. It's my boy, Penbrook began. He was unable to continue for a second, emotion overtaking him. He took a shaky sip of whiskey, coughed, and motioned for water. The water was what pushed Penbrook out of his sobriety. His eyes glazed over as if in a trance, and he spoke uninterruptedly. It happened just tonight. I let Johnny, my boy, go out with his friend Colum to play in the square. Even though they're only eleven, they're smart and always vigilant for their age. They know how to stay out of trouble. Now, I know what you're thinking. What kind of self-respecting parents would let two boys play independently with a murderer on the loose? I thought my boy knew better than other boys. It was getting dark, and Dot was beginning to worry. She told me to go to the square, grab the boys by the scruffs of their necks, and drag them back if I had to. 
Dot's a good woman, and for her to speak so forcefully to me showed me how worried she was. I started walking towards the square. The dark was beginning to press in, and I could hear the whistles of the constables announcing the curfew. I began to walk faster. As I was turning the corner, I ran into someone. I made to apologize, but then saw my Johnny lying on the ground, breathing heavily. I pulled him up in my arms, and he struggled, saying that he had to get help. I shook the boy and told him it was me, it was his pa, and I was here to take him home. His breathing came in powerful gasps, and I had to wait a little longer until his breathing slowed. We sat there on the dirty ground in the gathering night. I didn't ask him any questions, not right away. I didn't ask where Colum was. I didn't ask why he was running. I didn't ask him why he looked so frightened. When we got home, Dot tore Johnny from my arms and worried over him. His mother was probably just what the boy needed, for he was suddenly animated, like a switch had been pulled. I pushed my empty mug towards Ben for a refill. Penbrook pointed to his glass again. Ben hesitated for a second, before pouring another drink for the swaying postman. Despite his drunkenness, Penbrook's voice didn't slur. Johnny told me a horrible story. I didn't want to believe it, but he was so frightened. My disbelief wouldn't help him. He told me he and Colum had gone to watch the band playing outside of Shahid's tavern. They watched for about 15 minutes before Colum said he was bored and started walking through the square. Now, I don't want to speak ill of the boy or anything, but Colum wasn't what you call an adherent to the rules. He was often rude to his schoolmasters and short with his own parents. I didn't like Johnny running around with him, but what can you do? Boys will hang out with whomever they please. Johnny followed Colum until he stopped in front of the artifact. I don't know about you, but I never really liked that display. It's not right. Most around town think so too, but they're too afraid to speak up. They don't want it getting back to Mayor Hall that they doubt his wife's wisdom as the head of the tourism board. Anyway, Colum approached the display with a cruel smile. He waved his hands in front of the corpse. Check this out, Johnny, Colum had said, hovering his hands over the woman's chest and pretending to squeeze her breasts. She can't even do anything, he continued bringing his hands closer. Johnny says that he looked away. Colum's behavior had made him uneasy, and he was afraid of them getting caught, though there didn't seem to be anyone around. Colum continued his lewd speech, and Johnny tried to tune him out when he heard what sounded like a wet slap. Johnny was hit and fell to the ground. When he woke up, it was much later. He could hear the whistles of the constables as they patrolled. Somehow, they had failed to notice a boy lying prone on his back in the middle of the goddamn square. Useless Connies. Johnny stood up, looking around for anyone who could help. He tried to cry out for help, but his throat was closed with fear. That fear multiplied when he saw that Colum wasn't there. He stood up and walked towards the artifact. Colum had been standing there moments before, only it hadn't been moments before, because Johnny had been out for who knows how long. Johnny realized that the display case was empty. The corpse was gone. It was then that he took off running. The rain had let up in the time it took for Penbrook to finish his tale. He was still on his fourth drink, and he was once again twirling it slowly in his fingers. That's quite the story. Ben's voice was steady, measured, and testing. Penbrook laughed without humor, 
brought his glass to his lips and lowered it back down without taking a sip. I agree, I said a little too quickly. No one turned to face me. You have to admit it's a little hard to believe. I could feel the bile rising in my throat as I spoke, each word becoming more difficult to say. My fear had graduated to nausea. I'm not a liar, Pembroke said, as if it were an epitaph set in a tombstone. And neither is my boy. Nobody spoke. With the absence of the rain and the postman's steady drawl, the evening was silent, as if a large blanket had been draped over the world. In this silence, a woman's anguished wail sliced the night in two. Pembroke had told us his story right after telling the constables the same one. A search party was formed, with constables and townsmen alike combing the streets, beaches, and parks with rain jackets and lanterns held aloft in the dark. Colum's mother, Irina, was among these searchers, and she made the grisly discovery. Colum's body was found in Gardner Park at the edge of the town limits. I will spare the reader, whomever you may be, of the grisly state of the body. Suffice it to say, his throat was torn out. I can't imagine how his mother felt when she saw him. Words fail me utterly. It didn't take long for Pembroke's tale to grip the town. That day, the chatter in the square had a more manic energy, like bees buzzing in an agitated hive. A few townspeople roamed the streets carrying clipboards and asking for signatures on a petition begging the tourism board to remove the artifact. I signed as many of them as I could. That evening, I stayed in my apartment for most of the day, trying to read and subsist on the meager fare I had left in my kitchenette. Every time I looked out the window, I saw groups of men in the streets like packs of wolves out for the hunt. The day's events had tired me, the way other people's pain has a way of doing, and I was asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. What followed was a dream unlike any I'd experienced before. I was an adept dreamer and had the ability to know when I was dreaming. I could always force myself awake whenever things got too harrowing. But that was not the case that night. I started out in the square. It was completely absent of people. All of the shops that lined it appeared abandoned. Windows were boarded up, chairs were overturned on patios, and detritus sailed across the cobbles as if ambling down a country lane. I began walking towards the center, unheeded by any thoughts. My destination seemed to bend and recede as I moved. Judging distance and time was impossible, so it was both an eternity and an instant before I found myself in the center of the square, facing a familiar glass display case. The woman in front of me was not dead, could not be dead. Her face was calm, her eyes shut her skin soft, but she was not alive either. At least, not in the same way we are. Her eyes opened. There were no whites, just pure dark. I was rooted to the spot, unable to turn away. She grinned. The grin turned into a snarl. In her mouth were bone-white teeth sharpened to a point. Too many teeth for such a small, delicate mouth. Her maw gaped wider, her cavernous gullet like a train tunnel, ready to swallow me whole. I was able to see out of the corner of my eye that the square was now full of people, some faces I recognized. Many were in shadow, and some were beyond my field of vision. My head throbbed, and my fingers tingled. 
All this time, the corpse's mouth gaped wider, and a noise like a hundred men moaning at the bottom of a mine shaft escaped from it. This noise sent the crowd into a frenzy. I was knocked to the cobbles and trampled by dozens of booted feet. I could finally move and thrust my arms over my head to protect myself. I was finally able to scream. This scream tore through to the waking world. I vomited, my meager dinner of turnips and spicy cream sauce returning to stain my rug. I lay there, the upper half of my body cantilevered over the side of the bed, bile dripping from my open mouth onto the spreading puddle on the floor. I grabbed a rag, cleaned what I could, then rolled up the rug and leaned it against the corner. I sat on the edge of my bed for several hours, staring out my window and slowly sipping cup after cup of hot ginger tea. I did my best not to recall my nightmare or try to think over the day's events. In sleep and in waking, I wasn't offered a break from the fear that sat heavy in my gut. Mayor Hall announced an evening press conference in the town square the day after Column's body was discovered. Shops shuttered early that night, the clicks of their locks a sullen soundtrack in the early twilight. I placed a bookmark in my paperback, threw a tattered coat over my shoulders, and headed out into the street. The crickets chittering echoed the uneasiness in the air. It felt like walking to a funeral. I found Ben standing a good twenty feet away from his bar. I don't like this, he said. I really don't. I didn't say anything. Mayor Hall approached the square in his distinct gold and black chariot pulled by white horses. He emerged in a white suit with black stitching and took his place on the platform. It was only then that I noticed the line of constables behind him. They were all large, muscular men with cudgels at their hips. They looked ready for a fight. We've heard rumors, the mayor said, that certain recent events can be traced back to a single instance, when a female corpse was discovered on the beach some weeks ago. We were hoping for an identification by means of displaying her in the square for all to see, However, it has now come to my attention that several petitions have been circulating asking for this woman's removal. I am a man of the people, and always have been. Therefore, I have approved a measure to have the woman removed and stored in Dr. Skander's office. The constables will carry the display. Anyone attempting to intervene will be subject to arrest. The mayor left his post without conclusion, secure in the thought that his orders would be carried out. I sighed with relief. The madness with the corpse was ending. She would be removed from the square. She would be gone. The constables surrounded the artifact and lifted it onto their shoulders. The crowd began to stir. Some started to leave the square. Others were pulled toward the constables like a ship towards a hurricane. Please clear the way! came the familiar voice of Ray Bray, the constable who had comforted me when I'd found the corpse all those weeks ago. Please clear a path for the procession. We deserve retribution, a voice bellowed. Get that corpse! This litany spread through the crowd as they bucked and swelled. They echoed the man's words, chanting, Get that corpse! Get that corpse! Ben and I were swept along for a few seconds until the tide turned the other way. People were trying to escape the increasingly volatile situation. It wasn't long before we heard the sound of cudgels on flesh and screams of pain. Clear the square! came a painfully loud voice. My guess was a constable using a bullhorn. Clear the square now! More thuds and slaps and grunts and cries of pain followed this. People were panicking 
and it was getting hard to escape as people ran in every direction, hoping to slip through a gap in the tangle of arms and legs. It was hard to tell who was racing towards the corpse and who was running away. It no longer seemed to matter. A strong hand grabbed my shirt from behind and heaved me forward. I looked over my shoulder and saw Ben. There were other people behind him, everyone gripping the shoulder of the person in front of them. We need to get out of here, Ben said, his mouth close to my ear, his breath hot and agitated. Push! I grabbed the person nearest me, a woman who was cowering with her hands covering her neck. At first, she lashed out at me, catching me with a glancing blow on the side of my head. I forcefully turned her around. Just keep moving forward! I yelled as loud as I could. She nodded, her eyes glazed over in a numb panic. Someone must have hit her hard. A large bruise was starting to swell on her cheek. She didn't move, and I could feel the pressure on my back mounting. We have to move, I said, a little unkindly. Her terrified face told me I was making the situation worse. Listen, I said. What's your name? Uh, Alina. She said it weakly, and it was a miracle I heard her. Alina, we need to get out of here. I pushed her behind me. This is Ben. He's a friend. I looked into the barkeep's eyes, a wordless message passing between us. Alina took a firm hold of my grimy shirt. I smiled, even though this situation was beginning to overwhelm me. To B's Tavern, I called. All will be safe there. I charged forward. We were lucky to escape the chaos right in front of B's Tavern. We pushed our way in. Ben shouted at the bartenders, who went into action. They moved tables out of the way and cleared a path. People looking to avoid the chaos outside entered in a rush. I stayed at the entrance, eyeing each face passing through the doors to ensure they didn't carry a glint of mischief. Everybody looked scared, which seemed the appropriate response. The bartenders tilted the tables when the bar was full to form a barricade. It seemed unneeded at first, but we were lucky they had taken the precaution. After an hour of fierce screaming and scrambling, the square outside grew eerily quiet. It was as if someone had blown out a candle. Everyone in the bar had more or less regained control of themselves. Many were still scared, as was I, but life in Raven's Cove is hard at the best of times. We are a resilient people. I saw Alina tend to the wounded in a caring and deliberate manner. Her shocked face from an hour ago had transformed into a determined scowl. I watched her for a while, grateful that I'd grabbed her. Though there was an older woman with a broken arm, most only had cuts and bruises. The clamor outside began again one hour later. I was standing at the windows, dozing off. The chorus of rising voices outside made me spring up. Torches were lit here and there like stars in the night. Vague shapes and outlines formed in this meager light, though it was hard to see exactly what was going on. All I could tell was that there were a lot of people outside, and they sounded angry. Ben levered open a transom window that was above the main doors. He grabbed a stool and stood atop it, his bushy eyebrows scrunching with the effort to hear. I studied him as he listened and saw mounting horror dawn on his face. He stepped off the stool. Come with me, he said. I followed him, only to be followed by Alina. I turned to ask her what she needed, but she spoke before I could say anything. It sounds like something's wrong out there, she said. Her voice was strong and had no hint of the terror I'd first seen in her. She had hair the color of fire tied behind her head with a cloth wrapping. Her skin was pale, 
but she had a life to her, a pallor to her face that showed strength and tenacity. Despite this, her green eyes were kind. What do you mean? I asked. She said nothing, but raised her eyebrow incredulously. Look, Ben interjected. If you want to help, fine. Follow me. We held court in the tavern's seldom cleaned kitchen. So what's the big deal? I asked irritably. It was hard to hear clearly, Ben said. I could only hear snatches of conversation, but it sounds to me like they're going to burn the corpse out in the square. Alina and I stared at Ben like he was speaking a foreign language. Excuse me, what? I asked, failing to hide my emotions as effectively as Alina. It sounds like they somehow took possession of the corpse from the constables. I couldn't hear anyone trying to establish order or anything. They must have been overpowered and abandoned the chaos. Or something else, Alina said, her voice losing a bit of its strength. Were the people out in the square capable of such violence? It was hard to believe, but at the same time, resignation fell over me. I looked at Ben, but he was looking toward the front of the bar. What do we do? I asked. What can we do? Before anybody could answer, we were interrupted by a commotion. We gave each other worried looks and made our way up front. Without realizing it, we had become de facto leaders of this bar-turned-shelter. People gave us looks of pleading concern and hope as we passed. I did my best not to let worry show on my face. When we got to the windows, we not so gently pushed aside a few people who crowded the view out to the square. For the three of us to all see and hear simultaneously, we moved one of the tilted tables out of the way and cranked open the window. The cool air rushed in, and those close enough to receive its fresh burst all sighed in contentment. The crowd in the square had increased. It no longer sounded like the buzzing of bees. Now the voices sounded like possessed livestock, angry, guttural, and screaming. It was hard to hear specific words, but there seemed to be a general consensus that something must burn. We could see the platform where Mayor Hall had delivered his speech. A large log stood upright amid a pile of loose sticks and firewood. We watched, with dry mouths, as two large men we recognized as regulars at the tavern hoisted the limp corpse onto the platform. They tied it, her, around the log with a care that seemed uncharacteristic for what they were about to do. It didn't cross my mind to ask why it took two large men to carry a small corpse. I didn't have time to wonder. Instantly, other men with torches materialized on stage and lit the twigs and branches. The fire grew steadily. The crowd chanted a bloodthirsty song, and some danced on stage. Others smashed bottles onto the cobbles. This was a party to them, a great night out in a shitty little town that had seen its best days recede like the tide. The fire engulfed the corpse, briefly lighting the revelers in a spectral glow. Those dancing around the flames backed away, slapping at the helms of their pants. The crowd threw their heads back and laughed. Others held large bottles of beer or brandy, which they sipped liberally and poured into the mouths of their comrades, sloshing some on stage. Someone, only seen in a backlit shadow, slipped and careened face first into the pyre. His entire body ignited in roaring flames as if he had been made of coal. The man screamed an unholy scream, one that was echoed by the crowd as they attempted to put the fire out. Oh my god, Alina said, her hand covering her mouth. What the fuck, Ben said, his hands gripping the edge of the window frame so hard I could see splinters puncturing his flesh. 
the fire spread. Those who were aiding the burning man soon found themselves engulfed in flame. They ran in a blind panic, falling off the stage and into the dumbstruck crowd. The flames leapt from person to person, making the fire seem alive. Everywhere the crowd ran, they brought the flames with them. Shadow clothes caught fire. Chairs and tables on patios burst aflame. Anyone who ran into a building turned it into a tinderbox. Those safe in the tavern began to panic as the cool night air was replaced with heat and smoke and the sound of thundering footsteps. Ben cranked the window shut. With my help, he tilted the table back over the window. As soon as we stepped away, a crowd charged the tavern. The doors buckled and the tables began to rock back and forth. Everybody to the kitchens! Ben yelled. I let myself get caught up in the swell of people. Despite our fear, there was enough order that there were no new injuries while we escaped. I felt a soft hand grab my shoulder as I reached the kitchen. I turned my head to see Alina behind me, trying her best to keep pace. Where are we going? She asked. There's a rear exit in the kitchens. Leads to the rubbish alleys. Alina wrinkled her nose. Seems a better spot than the other exit, I said without humor. Alina smiled anyway, and I found myself smiling back, the warmth in my stomach not a product of the approaching flames. As people clambered over each other in the narrow alley, my eyes sought Ben. He was wedged between two rubbish bins, his back against the building opposite, pulling people up as they fell. Alina and I followed his example. When the last refugee left the bar, we looked inside. What we saw could have been more encouraging. The tables had been toppled over and the doors burst open. Revelers from the square spilled into the bar, screaming and igniting everything they encountered. It was uncanny. Was everything in the world suddenly made of dry paper? With a sorrowful look, Ben turned and ran down the alley. Alina and I followed, dashing through the overflowing streets, dodging flames, plumes of smoke, and falling debris. It felt like an eternity, but we eventually found ourselves approaching the open grasses of Delphi Park. It mirrored the scene in the bar, only on a much larger scale. People gathered in loose groups and tended to the wounded. Alina grasped my hand tightly. Our breaths came in large, painful swallows. Our eyes were fixed on the town we had just fled. Ben wasn't with us, but we didn't have the strength to search for him. Oh my god, said someone behind us. Raven's Cove burned. Homes, hotels, shops, warehouses, taverns, and tea houses all burned indiscriminately. The night was choked with smoke, the sky a sickly pallor in the light of the flames. The town constables, roused from their hiding places, summoned the fire brigade. They might as well have spit in the ocean for all their effort. I never thought that fire could be so loud, but the sound of the flames and collapsing buildings were enough to drown out the wails of anguish around us. We tore our gazes away from the horizon. We were led to a flat, dry field where people lay in neat rows on the grass, sleeping fitfully and restfully. Blankets and pillows grabbed from outlying dwellings were distributed. Alina and I found two spaces, side by side, and fell asleep quickly, our bodies finally catching up with our minds. We were greeted by an eerie silence the next morning. Looking at the grass around me, littered with blankets and bedrolls, I lamented my small, drafty apartment, its ruined rug, and the small collection of books 
that were now nothing more than ash. I stood up and made my way towards a column of smoke, this one small and coming from a cooking fire. I found Alina where I thought she would be, near the steaming pot of stew, doling out generous helpings to patient hands. I gave her a nod when she served me and found a spot on the grass to eat. I was soon joined by Ben and several other bartenders that worked at B's Tavern. Eventually, Alina joined us as well. There's talk of a cleanup effort, she said between sips of stew. I was hoping you would like to join. She looked at Ben. And you can check on the status of your tavern. Ben grunted. I could imagine that the thought of his tavern hadn't abated since the previous night. We slept in the same field that we had the previous night, for the smell of the carcass that was Raven's Cove was overwhelming during the day. We started with the tavern, of course. It took most of the day to clear the broken glass, twisted stools, and charred pieces of wood. Occasionally, we moved a piece of debris to find something still on fire. We put those embers out quickly. News of casualties started to trickle in slowly and only on the winds of rumor. Some said 600 dead, while others said over a thousand souls perished. The number of injured was even higher. By the time we lay our heads onto our bedrolls for the third night, a hospital train had arrived at the station from the city of Caravas to tend to the overflow of patients. Ben, Alina, and I continued cleaning up the bar. Never once did I ask Ben how he was doing. The manic way he scrubbed the floors of soot and the way he hauled trash into the large public receptacle in the square spoke of grief that could never be put into words. After the tavern, we offered our help in other parts of town. As we cleaned, the true destruction became apparent. In the absence of debris, the town appeared skeletal and malnourished, its gaps like rotting gums. As much as 60% of the building stock in town was deemed too damaged to save. No one could figure out how a small fire could get so out of hand. There was talk, of course. There was always talk. But forget that. What I'm about to impart to you, dear reader, is not gossip. It is a first-hand account. I was clearing debris from a collapsed building near my apartment. As I had feared, there was nothing left of my dwelling. By the time I'd finished helping Ben with his tavern, I'd come to find the building I'd lived in nothing but a husk of stone, charred wood, and ash. As I grabbed a large chunk of plaster, I saw a scrap of cloth that looked like a woman's dress. I recoiled, remembering tales from Delphi Park of people encountering bodies under the rubble, some whole, some in pieces and some burned beyond recognition. I steeled myself and cleared more debris. The more I moved, the more I was sure that I was digging up someone's grave. My stomach dropped into the sea. Before me was the perfectly pristine corpse of the woman from the beach, the one who was burned in the town square not a week before. Her skin was unblemished, with no burns, cuts, or breaks. Her raven hair lay in spider strands around her head like a demented crown. She stood out starkly against the sooty ruins. The woman's eyes were open. They were deep, black pools with no white around the iris. Her chest began to rise and fall. A mimicry, or mockery, of my panting breath. Her lips slowly parted to show her teeth, bone white, sharp, and too numerous. I thought about Penbrook's story. 
I thought about the state of the murder victims' bodies. I thought about the rumor mill of small towns and the fear that results from poor understanding. I hadn't wanted to believe the rumors. I hadn't wanted to believe the unbelievable. Now, I stared at the unbelievable and could not discount it. I know what you might say, as many have said to me, that I was merely hallucinating, that I was overworked, hungry, and sleep-deprived, that I dreamt the corpse's animation. Discount it if you must, but I know I wasn't asleep and wasn't hallucinating. Why would I hallucinate such horrors when the presence of a pristine and unblemished corpse amid the ruins of fire was enough for cruel nightmares? I screamed. I must have, for others soon stared at the corpse in amazement and fear. No one commented on her eyes, her teeth, or her breathing. She appeared lifeless among the rubble once others began to arrive. But I knew it was only an act. Ultimately, the remaining constables carted the corpse to a secret location that only Mayor Hall and a few constables knew. There, the corpse remains to this day, watched and guarded at all hours lest it wreak havoc again. As for me... I packed some food into a canvas bag and hopped on a train heading into the city. It was too traumatic to remain behind. I had no belongings, money, or talent, but I hoped to find some work and basic lodgings in Caravas. I knew it would be quite an adjustment from the windswept beaches and small-town pace of Raven's Cove, but I wasn't seeking a replacement. I was seeking a transformation. Alina came with me. We were still strangers, but we found being together soothed our minds. She encouraged me to write this account down to see if anyone would be willing to spread it around and verify its authenticity. She featured much more prominently in this tale, but edited herself out. She is shy about her good deeds, which I find humbling. Ben ended up staying in Raven's Cove. Letters between us are infrequent. Ben hoped I'd stick around and help him with the bar. My decision to flee with a woman I'd just met drove a wedge between us. That wedge is beginning to loosen and will one day fall away. In his last letter, he droned on about the progress of the tavern, which he had decided to redesign according to the principles of the Domus School, a new philosophy of architecture he heard about from a visiting urban planner who was in dire need of a drink. Though I often think of Raven's Cove, I need to catch up with its progress. I choose to remember the town I knew. I try not to think of the corpse, but my dreams don't give me much choice. I have found one certainty. The corpse wasn't entirely responsible for destroying my home. The town already had an open wound. The corpse was just an infection. The people of Raven's Cove made the choice to destroy something they did not understand. I have remained busy in my new life. As I write these words, I'm surrounded by books, periodicals, and journals. I scour these pages for accounts of murders that go unsolved. Murders that have a distinct signature, one that I've encountered before. I've found many and have attempted to discover some pattern or origin point for these killings. I'm close. Tomorrow, I board a train for Inovnia. It is said that, long ago, this small seaside town on the other side of the continent was beset by a string of murders after the burial of an unidentified raven-haired beauty who washed up one day on the shore.
You've been listening to The Incorruptible Corpse by T.F. Ahmad. Well, listeners, that concludes our broadcast evening. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's story. With the weather getting warmer, perhaps you'll have your own opportunity to find something bizarre on the beach in the near future. After all, everyone's life could use a little excitement. But if you happen to stumble across a corpse, maybe you shouldn't get it displayed in your local town square. Be sure to come back next week at the same time for more Tales of Terror. And until then, stay spooky. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. As for me personally, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, username Viking Guitar, and also on Instagram as Viking Guitar Productions. In particular, if you're looking for someone to provide voice work for your own project, or are in need of audio production of any sort, it would be wonderful to chat. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Nikki McSorley and Eric Peabody. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave us a kind comment. Lastly, 
Don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener... Your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.